Hi there. Thanks for joining me. Netflix runs a serverless Node.js platform that powers all the device's user interfaces. As the business evolves, the platform is growing to serve other use cases, as the web applications that support our content production. My name is Guilherme Yermeto, and I'm a senior platform engineer at Netflix with the Node.js runtime team. I will explain how we're evolving our platform while maximizing code reusability. To tell you where we are going, I better start from the beginning. Netflix started using Node.js at the end of 2013. And the first Node.js application received production traffic in the year of 2014. That early work evolved to be a current serverless Node.js platform called NodeCork. A NodeCork service lives in a container which is deployed into our container management platform named Titus and sits behind our level 7 application gateway named Zoo which is responsible for authenticating, validating, and routing requests from the diverse clients to the corresponding NodeCork service. Upon receiving a request, the NodeCork service will make one or more requests to the mid-tier APIs and format the responses to send back to the client. Both Zoo and Titus are Netflix open source projects I suggest you check them out on GitHub. The NodeCork platform main goal was to provide a managed experience where clients' teams could create custom API experiences tailored to their specific devices. For example, the Android team could create an API that would better suit the client design. Same goes for iOS, TVUI, and other client teams. In other words, BFFs, or backend for frontend. Using the platform, the client team can focus on their business goals while we abstract the complex infrastructure of platform offerings and Netflix. So this is what you need for a NodeCork service. It's a NodeCork JSON file and the route handler. That's it. That's all you need to have a production ready service. The route handler file may return an array of functions. And you can also specify middlewares on NodeCork.json. The platform will be responsible for three main areas. Observability with metrics, distributed tracing, help dashboard and centralized logging. Debugability with exception management and diagnostic tools. Examples of diagnostic tools are flame graphs and sampling heap profiler. And lastly, availability with configuration, alerts, service registration and discoverability. Basically, everything you expect from production-ready service. At the core of the platform, we have a RESTFI application with its Enroute module. Both RESTFI and Enroute module are open source. Check them out on GitHub. The Enroute module is responsible to read the NodeCork JSON file from the customer application and use it to locate all the route handlers. When we release a platform version, we're actually publishing a Docker image with the NodeCore platform runtime. And when a customer publishes a new version of the service, we layer those images, copying their application code into the platform image. We, as a platform, are responsible for monitoring 
and mitigating issues with the running process. When the application image is deployed, the service is ready to receive production traffic. This model allows the client teams to build applications that receive huge amounts of traffic and support of 182 plus million subscribers. Node Quark is highly optimized for that use case. As the business evolves, we're starting to power a different type of application, like the ones that support our content production efforts. And those applications have very different characteristics. While streaming have a few dozen applications with huge footprint and sometimes requiring thousands of containers each and serving dozens of millions of users, content production have a large number of applications with very small footprint and much more limited user base. Security is also different. While a streaming user has access to their own account and all the content library, content production applications have a way more nuanced authentication and authorization. We have to authenticate employees, partners, and then decide the level of access that each individual user has. And even though both of those types of services require distributed tracing and centralized logging, sampling and retention are not the same. For example, on streaming applications, we sample 0.1% of requests, while on content production applications, it makes sense to sample 100%. And while we, it's only cost effective to keep streaming logs readily available for the last 24 hours, we probably want to increase the log retention for the other applications to, let's say, a week. These applications, they are different, but they also share a lot of concerns um, around observability, which metrics really matter, uh, debugability, how do I quickly find out what's wrong with my service, and configuration, how do I configure uh, the best configuration for running a service in production. That's important too. Unfortunately, the original architecture had its limitations. The original design made a lot of assumptions about infrastructure and call paths. Other use cases were just not top of mind at that point. And stability was a major concern. Let me expand on that. So our team tries really hard not to break Netflix on new platform releases. It's a slow process. Every platform releases requires that we can marry the changes into multiple services, take 1% of the traffic and comparing it with the baseline. If there are any issues or performance degradation, we search for the root cause, we fix it, then we rinse and repeat until we get a performance that is desirable. This model just won't fit well for the fast pacing new applications that we aim to support. It creates risk on one side and reduces velocity on the other. And one added piece of complexity. So when we took a step back and look at the whole customer base, we saw that we have more difference than just content production and streaming application. Some of those applications rely on Falcor, some on REST, and most of the new ones, GraphQL. When I analyzed all the puzzle pieces, I got to the conclusion that the best approach moving forward was to extract all those components from the platform into self-contained modules or plugins. Yeah, I went there, plugins. And what do plugins solve a problem? How do they solve a problem? Well, plugins allow us to remove the fast evolving pieces of the platform 
source code, creating a much needed stability for the string applications. And most of them can be reused in all or almost all applications with maximized code reusability and minimize our support burden. So we're going even further, further than that. We are making everything plugins, like everything. Well, except that tiny little piece of platform code that load plugins, everything else is a plugin, even the server. And that gives us a lot of flexibility. Right now, our code is very intertwined with RESTFI, but if the server is a plugin with a stable interface, it enables us to experiment with other application frameworks, like FastFi. When we were designing the plugins, we researched a lot of other plugins. Right? Uh, we searched different plugins implementations, including how Happy and FastFi implement plugins. And we decided that we need a little bit more structure. So while Happy and FastFi plugins, you pass application server back to the plugin and let the plugin would find the server we chose a format where the plugin actually provide hooks and the platform control how and when those hooks are called. For comparison, this is a FastFi plugin. Pretty simple. And this is how a Node Core plugin looks like. So it's pretty simple too. Um, this is the interface that I'm working with. Let's go check that out. In addition to the startup and shutdown hooks, the plugins also provide the following lifecycle hooks, before request, pre-parsing, pre-routing, after request, on error. These hooks are called during the different stages of the request lifecycle. We chose this structure to give us control now and provide flexibility for the future. For instance, in the future, we might have a plugin which has different dependencies at startup and during the request lifecycle. Our plugins are also responsible to provide a debug interface and a mocking interface. The debug interface is used by the platform debug server, which runs in parallel with the customer servers and provide real-time health information for that instance. The mocking interface allows our customers to mock a plugin during unit or integration tests. And lastly, the routes keys allow us to register platform-defined routes. For instance, a GraphQL or Apollo plugin could define a slash GraphQL route, saving the user the trouble. This pluggable architecture enabled us to create another abstraction, which we call application profiles. Application profiles are type of applications with similar characteristics, meaning they use the same plugins. So an application profile can be seen as a list of plugins to load for a given application. We actually design it as a module that imports the plugins and exports an array of loaded plugins. In the future, that will allow us to um, use the profiles to require different versions of plugins. We're not there yet. we we'll hope to be there soon. So since profiles only load specific plugins, it reduces the risk uh, of a plugin built for content production to break an application on the streaming path. For example, if I just load the security for content production and I change that plugin 
very often as the profiles for um, streaming applications don't load that particular plugin it's fine that that plugin evolves fast and not even limited to plugins so the concept of application profiles can now be leveraged through the platform we can use it to load different dashboards register different alerts and even load different sidecars or daemons for each profile as we remove all the moving pieces from the core platform, its source code becomes very, very stable and rarely needs to change. This allows us in the future to shift our focus from platform releases to profile releases. Currently, our tooling relies on platform versions, but as we break the platform into smaller pieces, it becomes less important in relation with the profile versions. Where do we go from here? Well, for us, the next step is to allow our partners teams to create application profiles and give to their customers, enabling them to virtually build platforms on top of a platform. The interface that I show you, it's private to our team at this moment, but we plan to release that to or partner teams in the coming months. Right now we're trying to test, validate it and solidify it before we make it a public interface to them. And it's all very open-ended, but very excited. So we're very excited to see where this is going. Uh, and even beyond BFFs, we're now looking into serving federated graphs and server-side render applications. So, possibilities, possibilities, possibilities. Today I touched some subjects like distributed tracing, centralized logging, and metrics. Some of what we use at Netflix is internal, so I can't really recommend everything you use. But if you just need a place to start, I have options that I personally like to recommend and which are open source. For metrics and alerting, there is Atlas, which uses Netflix, and Prometheus, which is very well known. For centralized logging, I always liked FluentD and some of the Elastic products, especially Filebits, to send your logs to Elasticsearch. For distributed request tracing, Zipkin is definitely the way to go. For diagnostics, there's Flamescope, which you use Linux Perf. So you can use the Linux Perf package available on NPM. We use the same package on NodeCork. And lastly, for exception management, Sentry is very well known and easy to use. And I also always liked Airbrake. Thank you very much for being here with me today to let me share all work with you. I see you on the QA.